What's going on, everybody? It's Brian Tripp. Welcome back to another episode of the REI Live podcast. And we're just going to jump right in. I'm joined by my really good friend, Mr. John Martinez. How's it going today, John? It's good. It's good. I've been looking forward to this. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to it too. I know the last time I interviewed you um, on our podcast was probably three years ago. Um, and you do the sales training. And we really want to kind of dig into how we can be better at sales, how we can talk to people better, um, what we say, what we don't shouldn't say and things like that. But before I kind of get into all the details, would you just kind of do me a favor and kind of give us your origin story and just kind of tell us how you yeah. got into real estate? Because I know you're not, your background is not real estate, no. but how you kind of found the real estate niche. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, when I was, I guess, late teens, early 20s, uh, I worked for a catering company, saw a bunch of, you know, good looking, uh, well-to-do pharmaceutical sales reps, and I decided to get into sales. So I did, and over about two decades, I worked my way up through, you know, all commission sales and then into, you know, larger companies and some bigger roles and kind of just climbed the corporate ladder, uh, ended up in IT, um, managed services, infrastructure, that type of stuff, leading sales teams about, I think, seven years ago now. Um, I kind of hit a moment like, like, you know, the same way most investors get into investing, you kind of do your thing. And then you hit this spot where you go, is this it? Like, I, I want something different. So my different was not real estate. It was sales training. Um, and I launched a sales training company, uh, did a bunch of local companies and ended up kind of by accident in the REI space. Um, someone saw some of the work I did with the call center that, that sold leads to, to, uh, retail agents and investors. And we got connected, um, and it just kind of took off. I, I trained his team in Houston. He told some of his friends. And uh, before I knew it, I was training like, I don't know, it must have been 30 teams in the space. Uh, and that's when I knew, okay, there's, there's a need here and, and our stuff works really well in this industry. And over the next six months, I just narrowed my focus completely to this. Uh, so that's what I've been doing for six years is acquisitions training in this space. You know, and, and I know we're going to, we're going to kind of get to the, to the meat of what it is that you do, but just, you just kind of said something that, that really kind of triggered something inside of me is so many folks are searching and searching and so there's, there's, we're land of opportunity. You could do anything. I mean, you're super successful. You're, you're talented at a lot of things, but you have chosen to stick with one thing and just do it great. And I feel like there's a lot of folks in our industry that don't that we get distracted by a lot of different things because there's so much opportunity. Any advice on, or how are you able to do that? Any advice to folks that might be listening to this and they are a little bit, maybe got the little shiny object syndrome looking at a lot of different things. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of advice that, that works. The only advice I know is kind of, you know, what I lived through. And, and for me, it was really just a matter of taking a look around and saying, you know, what's working. I mean, I guess that's, that's probably the number one question I ask myself all the time is I kind of pause and I, I sit down and I go, okay, what's working and what's not working. So it was really easy because I got into sales training. There's a bunch of demand in this space. Um, I really enjoy doing it. You know, it, it's a lot different working with investors than it is working in corporate America. Cause when I was training those teams, here's another sales guy, this is required. I want to be out making calls and not doing this, you know, training versus people who are just out there making stuff happen for their own lives that are invested in themselves and, and really bettering their lives. Um, so I saw that, I enjoyed that whole experience. There was demand there. So for me, it was pretty easy because as I kept asking myself, what's working, it was this. Um, and when I ask myself what doesn't work, which I do probably a couple of times a year, I look at everything else I, I experiment with and I try and usually most everything else doesn't work. You know, it does to an extent, but not enough to garner a lot of attention and focus. So I turn it off. So um, really, that's just it. What's working and, and what doesn't. And you just do more of what works. I wish it were that simple. for Because some people's brains, entrepreneurial brains are just... They're just constantly going. So I'm, I'm glad you're able to find that. And I, and I want to encourage folks who are listening to this that stick with one thing, master it, and do be great at it. And when it comes to real estate investing, it all starts with getting a good deal. Real estate investing starts with you. Get, once you find a great deal, you can do it. You can keep it as a rental. You can wholesale it. You can flip it. You can do, you can do anything with it. But it all starts with getting a good deal. So the question becomes, 
how do we get a good deal? How do we, and I don't know if this is even the right terminology. This is, may not be the right way to ask the question. You correct me if I'm, if I'm saying this wrong, but how do we convince or persuade a seller to sell a property at, especially in this market that we're in? Yeah. Yeah. How do we convince I mean, I think a seller? There's two pieces to it. Obviously, um, there's the marketing component component where you just need enough people to talk to, right? Mm -hmm. And they need to kind of be in your um, in your target demographic, uh, you know, usually distressed sellers. So that's a huge part of it, right? If you it doesn't matter how great you are at sales, if you're talking to one person a month, you're not going to get very far in this industry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one half that's really important. And the reason why I bring that up, I'm, I'm not into, I don't market anything or anything like that. The reason why I bring it up is because uh, I hop on the phone and I take some of our sales calls every now and then. And um, we, we turn a lot of people away, not because we don't want to work with them or anything like that, but if they're too new and, and I say, you know, what's lead flow look like? You know, what are your sources? And they say, well, I really haven't got that going yet. No amount of sales is going to help. Sales training is going to help you, right? So I always say first start with lead generation. And once you get that going, then you can start focusing on converting those leads into something, right? You got to put the, the horse before the cart and, and not the other way around. So I'll talk more about sales and your specific question, because that's what I do. Uh, but I did want to mention that. Um, you know, I really don't think it is persuading or convincing as much as it is uncovering the compelling reasons that people already have inside them as to why they would sell and, and do a deal with you. Um, you know, we talk a lot about motivation, and there's all kinds of signs of motivation out there. And we, we target motiv motivated sellers with our marketing. And that, that's such a buzzword that's just thrown around all over. But usually um, most investors or acquisition agents will, you know, look at motivation as a checkbox, like, oh yeah, distressed or, you know, the financial, you know, distress or they're behind on this or that. I think when it comes to conversions, um, you have a long heart to heart about their motivation. And what I, what I mean by that is you just, you want to dive deep. You want to figure out why would you sell? Why would you sell to me? Why would you sell this way? And after you, you know, uncover two, three, four things, you start to dive into, well, why is that important to you? And when you have that type of conversation, what you end up is the seller telling you, listen, these are the four reasons I need to sell. And this is why it's, it's so dang important for me. And it, it does a couple of things. Number one, oftentimes it just, they're looking at their situation from a whole new perspective for the first time. They might realize how big of a priority it is for the first time. Um, and then there's other, some other like uh, psychology type things that, that play into it. When you, when you start to talk about those things, it increases the urgency someone feels to take action. It's kind of like, I look at it like pain, right? Um, the more pain you feel, the more compelled you are to, to stop it, right? To, 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 to make that go away. So if you have a, you know, a little thumb prick, uh, no big deal. If you feel like your head is just, you know, you have a migraine or something like that and you're just dying, you're gonna do whatever you can to, to get help. So when we talk about people's motivation, they start to, and we really live there for a while, they, they really feel compelled to do something about their situation and to make a change. So, you know, when I look at, REI sales or acquisitions. I think the sale is made very early in the conversation. It's in that, that motivation piece. That's when someone actually decides I want to make a change or not. And that's early in the conversation. Yep. So walk me through, and, and you know, we're talking with John Martinez uh, today, REI Sales Academy. Highly recommend you guys check out John, especially at the very least follow him on all the social platforms, puts out some, some incredible content. But John, take I guess maybe the best way to do this is, is let's take me through like an appointment or a conversation, mm -hmm. or let's just, let's just say, and I know so much is done online today. I'm, I'm a old school. I like to be belly to belly. I like to be face to face with, with, with folks that uh, I'm talking to. I still go on live appointments. Um, so let's, let's take it from that angle. And then maybe we'll do, take it from the phone sure. call angle, but so, you know, I would have an acquisitions member um, set an appointment for me and that's it. So the, the initial call on the phone is really just, just not anything deep, but it's just, I'm just taking down basic information and setting an appointment. And by the time I get there, I'm, I'm walking into really, I've never spoken. I've never spoken with the seller. Let me ask you this first. Is that the right way to do this? How would you recommend setting an appointment, going on an appointment? Should I, should I make a follow-up call personally? 
just talk about that component first. Yeah, we'll sure. So I don't think it really uh, matters if you're involved early or not, or if you make that call. I think what is really important though, is you let people know what to expect because when you don't know what mm. to expect, especially if there's a stranger coming to your house, um, if you're like me, a lot of people we've talked to over the years, you get a little antsy, um, might stress you out a little bit, and you might end up, you know, delaying the appointment, canceling it all together because it's just it's just what we do. We don't know what to expect, right? Mm, um, think of it this way: if if you get a text from your significant other that says we need to talk. Like what, you freak out, right? Because you don't know what to expect. And then if you don't know what to expect, you're expecting the worst, right? That's kind of what we do with our sellers. If we just say, hey, someone's showing up, right? Uh, they start to freak out a little bit. And that'll cause, uh, number one, it could be a canceled appointment. It's probably worst case scenario. Uh, a delayed appointment, which is not as, you know, not optimal either. Um, but what typically happens is they keep the appointment, but since they don't know what to expect, their guard is really up. And it takes a long time to kind of break through that wall and to, to build some type of rapport. So really the most important thing would just be to let them know what to expect. Hey, listen, Brian's going to come out there. Uh, you'll recognize him. You know, he's a bald guy, uh, really good looking. <laughs> uh, and anyways, here's what he's going to do. Typically, he's going to just want you to give him a quick tour of the property so he can uh, really figure out the most he can give you for it. He'll answer any questions that you have. Don't be afraid to ask anything at all. And, um, you know, he'll probably have some questions for you. So he knows how he, how he needs to put everything together, what timelines are, what your concerns are, that type of thing. Uh, so he can give you the best offer possible. Usually that lasts 45 minutes, maybe an hour. At the end, he'll give you an offer. If you love it, he'll talk about potential next steps. Um, and hey, if it's not a good fit, don't worry about it. Um, you know, we just want to go and put our best foot forward and, and see where it goes. And if it's a fit, then great. And if not, then, uh, you know, no big deal. We appreciate you giving us a shot. So just setting uh, those expectations like that. And I'd recommend you do that exact same thing when you showed up. That will really lead to um, higher uh, appointment rates, uh, keep rates. And then it, it just really accelerates that rapport building when you get there. John, that's something that's so simple. Yep. And, and it's and it's almost something that and, and when we're in the industry, when we're in it, we typically skip over the easy, simple things because we're, our brain is just wired to like, that's simple. I, it just goes to the next step. That is such a simple step, but it's, I see how it's so powerful at the same time. Yeah, it's just looking at it from, I mean, it, I'm guilty of it. I think we're all guilty of it. Anyone that, that has a job, has a career, runs a business, you do the same thing day in and day out. And it just kind of, you get used to it and it's no big deal. But if you look at it, through someone else's perspective, if you put their shoe, you put yourself in their shoes for a moment. I mean, if I have someone coming to my house and I have no idea why um, or, or what's going to happen, I, my guard is going to be up big time, right? I mean, just even think about this: if someone knocks on my door and I don't know who they are, I'm like peeking out the window. I'm, I'm asking, "Hey, dude, are we expecting someone?" I'm asking my wife. So you just want to relieve those kind of tensions or fears or anxieties because it's it's going to help push everything along a little quicker. Okay. So we've set the appointment. Yep. We've set the expectations, which is really important, which it sounds like it doesn't have to necessarily be me. It could be my team member that sets the appointment, my VA, whomever it might be. And we arrive on the scene. Kind of walk us through what, how you would kind of start. Um, and it, it starts with like even getting out of your car, maybe with what you're wearing, maybe with what your car looks like. Is it washed? Does, do any of these things matter? And if they do, what, what should we be doing? Yeah, I mean, so so there's a lot of little things like that 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 could matter. I mean, you could go to, to the extremes on the spectrum, right? If you show up in a Rolls, um, there's a very different expectation uh, going into there versus if you showed up on a skateboard, right? So those are obviously two extremes. Obviously, one's not professional and one uh, is, you know has deep pockets, right? Um, usually, when it comes to if, if you're talking about dress and things like that. The rule is uh, in any, any industry is to dress one level above your prospects. So if they're gonna be jeans and a t-shirt then jeans and a polo would work well, right? You don't wanna wear a three piece suit. So typically to be safe, just one level above whoever you're talking to. Uh, and that could go for your car too, right? Just any run of the mill car is gonna be perfectly fine. Now, again, you go to the extreme one way or the other, um, there's gonna be some issues. So that, that's just the simplest way to look at it. Um, after that, um, walking in, I'd, I'd suggest setting those same expectations again. Someone might have done it on the phone, but if you do it again, 
It's going to have the same effect. And now they heard the exact same thing twice. So we're actually building rapport and trust without even getting into the conversation mm-hmm. because you said something, you did it, you said something and you're doing it. Mm-hmm. So I think that that would be the first steps out of the car up to the door. Yeah. And so you mentioned that word rapport. I've heard people talk um, who maybe they're in the industry, maybe they teach it. Um, they say something like, if you're in that house, it, if you're in that house for less than 30 minutes, then you haven't built enough rapport. If you haven't built enough rapport, you're not going to get the deal. Um, I've, you know, I've had people tell me if my sales guy comes back in, in less than an hour, then I'd kick him out or you know, some crazy stuff like that. So talk about rapport. What's appropriate? Yeah, so, I mean, what's not, uh, what's not appropriate? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't put any, any time frames around it. Um, because if you have a good sales process, you're going to find out quickly in some cases that you need to disqualify someone and you, you'll get there pretty quick. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean there's no reason to make, you know, make a best friend if someone's not qualified and there's no way they're doing a deal with you. You can sometimes find that out pretty quick. Um, I, I do get, you know, if you look at best practices, um, that if we're talking belly to belly, best practices, typically the offer is actually made at about the one hour mark with our best clients anyways. The ones that have scaled successfully, put tons of people in the same position, uh, no matter what walk of life they're in, uh, they, they, they all have great conversion rates. One hour is usually when the offer is dropped. So um, using that as, as kind of a, wow. you know, a, a benchmark, um, if you're going in and, and you're running through your entire sales process and making an offer 10 minutes into it, you just know you've missed some stuff. Now, that mm-hmm. might be rapport, that might be you know, a few other things that you just skipped over. Uh, but, but that's just kind of a good benchmark to look at as far as best practices go. Um, now, when you talk about rapport specifically, all that really means is there's some type of connection and trust. Um, there's dialogue. Some of the walls are coming down. When you get into a good sales call, you're going to have to figure out all the reasons why someone would do business with you. We, we touched on that. Um, there's got to be some trust there, some rapport. And you're also going to want to talk about all the reasons why they might not do business with you, right? All their concerns, uh, you know, in the sales world, more commonly known as objections. So you're going to want to proactively discuss those too. And if those walls are up, you're not going to be able to talk about either of those things. And if you can't talk about either of those things, when you get to your offer, there's nothing to, there's no context to it. You can't say, hey, this is what you want. I'm going to help you get there with this. And uh, I know you had these concerns, so let me address those. You just can't do it. And if you can't do those two things, your offer is going to fall flat and you're just relying on price, which is not the game that investors mm-hmm. play. Um, so as far as, as building rapport goes, uh, you know what? It's, it's kind of like, uh, Brian, have you ever had someone trying to get something from you and they were being a lot nicer than they usually are and you knew it was just because they're trying to get something from you? Probably, have you ever yeah. been in that situation? Yep. Yeah, we all have, right? Um, and, and in that situation, you know what's going on. You're like, yes, you're buddy buddying right now. We're best friends. What yep. do you want from me? And you don't have the best feeling about it, right? You're not anxious to give someone something. We, we can see through it. Oftentimes, I think investors or acquisition agents, they kind of fall into the same trap and sellers see right through it, right? When it's the old school sales stuff that's been around for a hundred years where it's like, Oh, you, you fish, I fish too. What's your favorite sports team and that type of stuff. Now, if it's authentic and real, that's good. But oftentimes people are just trying to draw these, these uh, similarities. Uh, people have seen it a thousand times before. And now instead of building rapport, what they're actually doing is the opposite. And someone's, oh, another slick salesperson. Yes, yes, yes. I know how this works. You're building rapport. They've seen it a thousand times. There's nothing new about this. And you do the opposite. So the best way to build rapport is just like, well, just think about someone you have good rapport with, right? A friend, a family member, a colleague that you really like. They don't want anything from you. And they ask you more about you than they talk about themselves. So um, if I was going to put that into practice here, I would just say, number one, I don't want anything from you. We kind of covered that a little. Hey, if this works out, great. If not, it's no big deal. Bang, we check that off. And then just asking them about themselves. So taking the tour of the property, looking at the house is an amazing time to do this because you can just chit chat, right? You can keep them talking. You can ask them about stuff you see. You can ask them about their life. It really doesn't matter. The more they talk, it doesn't even matter what it's about. Um, the more rapport is built, um, the closer they feel uh, to you. And you might've just said two words, but if they just unloaded their life story on you, they're going to feel this closeness to you. The walls are down. 
Yep. People's favorite topic is themselves. Mm -hmm. So getting people to talk about themselves. I was actually going to ask you, how do you, how much is too much rapport? Maybe that's not the right question to ask because maybe there's no such thing, but you touched on it. There are people who do things cheesy and corny and force it. Any, you know, if if you said if it's genuine, you know, because I've been in situations where I've seen people and it's super, super corny. And it's, and you know what they're doing. And like you yeah. mentioned earlier, I kind of already feel like you're about to, there's going to be like, you're going to unload a big ask on me or some, something's going to happen here. Is it just trying to help them let their guard down? Uh, you know, like you mentioned earlier by setting expectations. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that's all rapport is really built to do is establish some type of connection. So those walls start to disappear. Yeah. Um, and, you know, similarities and commonalities absolutely do work. But, you know, that only caveat there is just make sure you're being 100% authentic, because if you're not, people, it's, it's slimy and people see through it, right? So right. whether whether they see through it or not, it's kind of slimy. And if they do see through it, you're not doing yourself any favors. So no matter what, uh, I, I don't recommend doing anything ever except for being authentic. And that's kind of that's kind of the test I use when we look at different sales processes is, man, you should be above board. Um, Whatever system you're using to sell, if you can't tell your seller exactly what you're doing and why, that should be a sign that Mm. something's not right here, right? If you're hiding something um, and you can't just say, here, here's why I'm asking these questions, then, then that should be a sign right there that something with your sales process is off. You probably already know it because you probably don't enjoy doing it, right? Mm-hmm. We've all, I, I've been in sales a long time and I've been trained in certain ways in the past where I just didn't like it and I didn't enjoy it and I didn't feel comfortable. Come to figure out it's because I was doing stuff I wasn't comfortable with. I can just, you give I me, like John, can you give me an example quiet. in the real estate industry? Give me an example of like, like what would be uncomfortable that we would be doing? Like, what would we be hiding? Example, I've heard people keep, um, and I don't, I don't know any specific names. If I did, I wouldn't drop them. But um, again, you, you see a lot on social and stuff like that where people, um, some strategies are, hey, let's lock up the deal for more money than we know we can pay because once that commitment is there, we've got a better chance of renegotiating it than if we went in initially with that price, right? Um, that's obviously slimy. Uh, it's it, it just, it, it, if you're doing it, it shouldn't feel good because you know, you know, your intentions are bad. Uh, so that, that's just one example of when you're doing something um, that's not above board and it feels bad. That it's a sign that, Hey, this is probably not the best process to be using. For sure. And I, and I think obviously rapport happens pretty much the whole time. It never really stops. Yeah. Um, you mentioned an hour. Some of your some of your better sales uh, folks that, that you trained that that seems to be the magic number there. That seems like a really long time. What are some other things we should be doing? Obviously, we're touring the house. Obviously, yeah. we're building rapport. What are some other things that we're doing in this hour? That's a long time. It's a lo- well, yeah. I mean, if you're walking in touring a house and giving an offer, that's a big stretch, right? That's a massive stretch. Uh, oh, probably be dang near impossible to do. Um, so what they're doing is really there's, and, and I touched on it briefly, but I'll go a little deeper this time. They're focusing their conversation on two core areas, uh, before they get into the offer. The first area again is motivation. And yes. we find that can take 20 to 30 minutes. Usually they're doing all the talking. Um, you know, you, you slide into that conversation with, with just simple questions like, Hey, tell me what's going on with the property. Why are you even considering selling? Um, and then just keeping that conversation going, right? Well, hey, you know, sounds pretty important to you. What's going on? How long have you been thinking about that? You know, when you say you're, you know, it's kind of stressful, what do you mean? And those are some simple questions, but those few questions I just asked could have led to a 20 minute conversation because people just, you know, the first question might be a, a couple of words uh, with their answer. The second one, they start to open up a little bit more. You get a little bit deeper, they might talk for 10 minutes. So, um, you know, when I, I just went through this um, yesterday uh, with our sales training. We did a wrap up. For, we, we ended up a training session, a uh, 12 week session yesterday, and we brought out some resources. And one of the resources for our sales training is actually everything you need to say during the sales call, it's on one page. It, you can put it on a single page. Everything you need to say, every way to overcome resistance, every question you need to ask, how to negotiate and, and make your offer properly, 
a page. So that's a big sign that they're doing most of the talking. Um, you know, I look at a sales call like this. Uh, I'm, I'm a Missouri boy. Um, so we've got uh, not oceans around here, but a lot of rivers. And so one of the funnest things, one of the most enjoyable things I did growing up was just going on river floats. You go two, three days, you put a canoe in the water with a cooler, some gear, you camp on the banks. And when you're floating a river, you know, one, one misconception is people think you're paddling the whole time, but you don't. The river has a current. A sales call has a current. It has a flow. And whether you're in that canoe or whether you're on the sales call, the way you navigate it is you just kind of get a little bit of momentum. You paddle once or twice and you let, you let the, the conversation take you. You let the, the, the river take you. And if you see that it's going in the wrong direction or if you see you want to move in another way, you can put your paddle in the water just for a second and you correct course. That's really what a good sales call should feel like. You get the momentum going when you build that rapport, you guide the, the current, their conversation, what they're talking about with your questions and uh, you get to the end. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of an off the for 90% of people, they're gonna have no idea what I'm talking about. I don't think so. I, th I think that's a great analogy. I mean, maybe that's just because I do some canoeing with my kids and, and I'm, and I know what you're talking about, you know, uh, especially, you know, we canoe in a place where there's, there's a dam at the beginning of the river and they they let more water in and the current can go quite fast. You don't have yeah. to paddle a whole lot. So no, I think that that's great. Let me ask you about this though, because I heard you say earlier about objections we should be uncovering objections and talking about the objection, almost addressing the elephant in the room before they ever come up. Yeah. Or am I right here? Or am I yeah, wrong? Or how, and how do we do that? How do we, is that just us paying attention and, and, and doing more listening than talking? Yeah. I mean, you, if you've got some things that, that, you know, there's the common objections, right? Uh, the most common objections are going to be uh, things based around uh, what we call influencers, just, you know, it doesn't matter if there's one or two people signing off on the deal. Typically in our lives, especially like this, they're, they're getting information from someone else. They're getting advice. Sometimes they ask for it, sometimes they don't. Sometimes that advice from mom, dad, uh, a friend, a colleague, some professional, sometimes it's, it, it, it weighs very heavily on them. Sometimes they're actually making the decision and they're going for them to the advice and doing whatever they say. Sometimes it's just a little bit of, of weight to that advice. But what we find is typically they're getting some advice, some information, some influence uh, from, from outside parties. So really bringing that up pretty early. Uh, and again, it is just asking, it's simple as that. You know, I, just something as simple as, hey, listen, if we get to the end of this thing um, and I make you an offer and you love the offer and you say, let's just do this, John, would there be anyone who might be even a little bit upset you didn't you know, run it by them first or at least tell them what you were planning to do, right? Mm -hmm. That's not going to uncover people who can sign off on the deal, but that question right there will uncover people who are going to have some type of influence or maybe be, even be able to veto the deal and go, I think this is a really bad idea. And they go, you think so? Okay, I'm shutting it down. Um, so you ask, right? Other options. Why not list it? Why not keep it? Why not rehab it yourself? Um, that's another common thing that if people haven't answered those questions for themselves, when you get to the end, they're going to go, well, I'm still considering these other options. So let me think about it. Right. So you want to address that proactively. Um, money's always a big deal. We do that a little differently. We, we, we talk about money in the negotiation um, uh, and really get people to the point where they feel comfortable with the offer. That, that's through good negotiating. That's also when we talked about motivation, the bigger problem you're solving um, the more, the, the less you can ask, right? The more they'll pay for help, in other words, right? The bigger, and just, just think generically, the bigger problems we have in our lives, the more we're willing to pay, right? Mm -hmm. If I have a small problem, like, hey, I'm out of paper clips, I'm not paying that much to get more paper clips. If I have a big problem in my life, like a loved one is very ill, I'll pay anything to solve that problem, right? So a lot of that is number, taking the money off the table is really diving deep into the motivation, but there's always going to be that question of, am I getting the best deal possible? Mm -hmm. And that, that you take care of in the negotiation. Um, there's some, some other objections or concerns that are really around just risk and discomfort, right? Maybe they're not comfortable with your business, the way of doing business. They don't know what to expect, how a deal like this goes down. Um, maybe they don't know where they're going to go. They're concerned about credit. Uh, they don't know how quickly or slowly they can move. They're concerned about packing and actually moving. All these things can lead people to, to say, I need to think about it. So it only makes sense to talk about it up front so we can either 
come up with solutions that most real estate investors have very simple solutions for, for a lot of these common uh, concerns. Um, or maybe you find out this concern, this, this is going to kill the deal and there's nothing I could do about it. If I have a deal that goes south that I know I'm not getting, I would rather know why I'm not getting it than just go, was I really close? Right. Was it just, was I a thousand bucks off? Was, you know, what killed that deal? Is it, do I need to call them again? When you know what actually killed the deal, you, you, can, you can proceed with, well, with the data, right? How do I want to follow up? Do I want to follow up? What's my strategy for continuing or not continuing? So those are the most, I'm sorry, I was so long-winded there, but those, those are the most common objections we see. And yeah, you just ask about them. Yeah. And you also mentioned about the, the offer, the negotiating comes with the offer. Is there a specific way that you um, recommend making the offer verbally? come in with a piece of paper it's already written some people say the number needs to be and 24 cents you know something like so precise can it be just round numbers off the top of our head any suggestions any any data that you've found that kind of yeah. proves one method works better than another yeah so we use a little bit of some of all those now like if you're going to use um an odd number final offer that needs to be your final offer you can't offer like $105,724 in a quarter and then go to like 150, right? Uh, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So if you're going to do that, it actually is effective because what happens uh, you know, in, in someone's brain is they, they say, well, that number came from somewhere. That's a calculated number. Uh, there's nothing left for me to take from this person. I won. I'm now comfortable knowing that I got everything I could out of this deal. I'm comfortable moving forward. Right, like if you're losing deals over one, two, or three thousand um, bucks, it means you didn't negotiate properly. They just felt like there's still money on the table here, and I don't feel comfortable moving forward until I get every one of those dollars. So you can use that. That that that's kind of your when you hit maximum allowable offer, you can do that, and it actually is really effective. Um, I think the most important thing about making your offer is, uh, and you can do this, by the way, without actually making an offer, I'll explain what I mean, is it's resetting expectations. Um, we kind of value things based on comparisons, right? Um, for example, and I, I, I don't even know what product I'm talking about, but if I go into a store expecting to pay $300 for something, and I find out I could get it for 100, that's a smoking deal. I don't even have a product in mind, but I could just say I was expecting 300. It's only hundred bucks. And everyone who's listening is probably going like, that's a good deal. You got to get it. Like, right. You're good of a deal. To, you don't even so, know what it is. Right. Right. But you, instinctively, you know, that's a good deal. Same thing with buying houses. Their number in their head is probably going to be a lot higher than what you're going to offer. So when you make that low offer, it's no surprise. It's shocking to people. It's a big turnoff. Sometimes they get angry. Sometimes they shut down completely. Um, and they just dis disengage. Um, so we want to give them a different comparison number so we don't have that, that same effect. So I find something just as simple, as simple as say, and again, this is why I said you don't even have to make an offer. Something just like, hey, listen, um, I did some research before I came out uh, for, for what similar houses were selling for two investors and things like that. A couple that sold for 50000 and I was absolutely shocked. That was much less than I thought any of these houses would go for. I didn't make an offer, right? In fact, I'm probably agreeing with them. They're shocked too. But I just reset expectations when I dropped that 50000 Now in their head, they're going, I may not be getting that 150 right? If some are selling for 50 I'm not selling for 50 but they're already adjusting expectations there. So now when we make an offer, uh, whatever our, our, our first offer is going to be, is going to be perceived with a lot less shock. It's going to be perceived in a better way, right? Some people use low comps. I, don't, I never used low comps when I was in the field um, training because sometimes people just didn't believe them. Sometimes they had comps of their own where they're like, well, I talked to Susie, my neighbor, and she sold for 400, right? So they, could, they sometimes backfired on me. And then I had to go back to the drawing board and go, I get why low comps work because they're resetting expectations. But how do we do it in such a way where you can't lose? So just dropping a number like that, or even saying something like, hey, listen, a house like this, I would, you know, it's kind of, you know, buying houses as is, is a little bit risky. Um, I would love to pay around 
40 or 45,000 bucks for it. Cause I knew if I could buy it at that price, um, whatever I found, I probably wasn't going to lose my bottom on it. I'd, I'd probably be okay. Uh, obviously you're not selling for th that price, but uh, that, that's, that would be a home run for me. I'd probably be closer at two. You see how we reset expectations without even making an offer. One of the things that investors, especially new investors or acquisition agents are so afraid of is that offer because not really because of the offer, but because of the reaction. So when you can soften it like that and yeah. kind of reset expectations without just like throwing this incredibly no low number at them, like I'll give you 50, what do you say? Um, right. it, it's a much better lead into the negotiation. Do you recommend having them make an offer first if, if you can? You know, it, I go the opposite of most there. Um, no, uh, I don't recommend that at all. In fact, I don't want to know for a couple of reasons. One, hmm. they're price anchoring themselves. Now, when I come in with my offer, it's going to be compared to that number. And I just did the opposite, right? Wow. Like that, that's going back to the analogy. If I was going to the store expecting to pay 100 for something and they told me it was 300 bucks, I'm getting ripped off, right? So I don't want them to control that first number. And honestly, I don't care what it is because whatever they're thinking doesn't impact my, my offer, right? In fact, it could do a lot of mental damage. If I ask for their number and I know I'm going to, you know, my maximum allowable is like 110 and they say 300, that's going to mess with my mind, right? I'm going to all of a sudden go, oh, geez, I am way off. I'm going to be a lot more timid about everything that goes forward. I might even be mentally checking out going retail seller, no deal. So um, for those reasons, I don't want them to control that comparison number, that price anchor is what it's called. Wow. And because I don't want them to derail me from my sales process, I don't want to know the number. Never heard someone say that before. That's And, and I love your explanation too. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I like that. The price anchoring though, I've found is super important. It's one of the most important things I do is to price anchor, get that, just like you said, I don't even know if it's a good deal or I know it's a good deal. I don't even know what it is. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So anything else we need to know, John, about the offer about, I mean, do we, I mean, are, are we putting it on paper? Is it in a contract or is it verbal? Uh, typically I see it verbally, but honestly, it, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, it really doesn't matter if it's on paper. I've done it both ways. I've, I've made most of my offers verbally. And again, I'm not a real estate investor, but when I started doing this, I, I traveled for a couple of years and I trained, trained uh, investors and acquisition agents in the field. So uh, when I talk about my experience, that's, that's where it comes from is, is buying houses kind of coast to coast. Um, but I've done it both ways. Typically it's verbal, um, but there's been a few cases where I finally got down to that, that final number. Uh, and I, I thought about it for a while and I put it on a piece of paper and I slid it over and I just said, listen, if it works, that's fantastic. If that's not going to work, totally understand no hard feelings. Yeah. And, and then just kind of leave it there. Before we go, John, I want to ask you specifically about cold calling and texting. Um, and when we're in a cold call environment, a lot of this is going to still apply, but maybe like the lead in, right. How, give, so give me some when tips on that. About cold calling, I think the most important thing to realize is that most people live on autopilot. Uh, you've probably seen different studies where like, you know, we make so many decisions a day on autopilot. Um, that's how we live our lives, right? It's like, um, like I said, if a stranger comes up to my door, I'm on autopilot. I'm looking out the window. I'm asking my wife. These are things that kick in without me even knowing. Sometimes when we drive, we're on autopilot. We get from one area of the city to the next without even remembering what we were doing. When it comes to cold calling, if you don't know who that person is, especially in the age of cell phones where people know who they're calling, it's not like they're calling your, you know, your, your house or your business. Hey, is John there? If someone calls and says, is John there to my cell phone? I'm already on autopilot. You don't know me, right? Um, you're, you're selling something or you're going to waste my time. And my autopilot is going to automatically be, what can I do for you? What do you want? Right. Just exactly. without even thinking about it. Cause I just like, I don't want to him and haw. Just let's get to the point. Who are you? Right. That's what happens in telemarketing all the time. You have your line, your autopilot, everyone else in the world has their autopilot line where it's take me off your list, blah, blah, blah. So I think the most important thing when cold calling is just to snap people out of that autopilot by not sounding like a telemarketer or someone who wants something from them. So they actually listen to, to what you have to say. Give me an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of, of uh, 
ways we do this, you know, there, there's a, a thing called tactical empathy, uh, or really the psychology of empathy. Uh, we use a lot when we do cold calling or, or train on cold calling, um, because it throws people off, just kind of being unsure about yourself. Think about it this way. I'll explain empathy this way. Um, if you opened up your front door, and there's this cute cat just limping around, instinctually, we want to help it, right? You're going to be like, I'm going to get it some water. I'm going to find out whose it is. When, when things are in need, instinctually, people feel the need to help. So I want people to help me out. So I'm a little unsure of, of the call when I call. Um, and I, I let that shine through. And that, even by itself, is going to interrupt that pattern and knock people out of autopilot. So it might sound like this. Uh, hey, listen, I'm really sorry for uh, calling you out of the blue here. Um, listen, I was looking at a house at 123 Main Street, really wanted to see if I could make an offer on it. Um, no idea if I'm even calling the right number here. That right there, just something as simple as that will knock people off of autopilot and get a much better response than if you just said, hey, is this Mr. Smith? Right. Yeah. No, I love that. And you you bring up tactical empathy and I can't help but think of Chris Voss. Um, yeah. Never split the difference. That's the first time I heard that. Is that where you got that? Or do you, if, I'm sure, surely you've read Chris Voss. Well, I know Chris, we had that before Voss um, and because we called it something else before and we just needed a, a, a more zingy name. So that's where it came from. I think, and I read Chris Voss and never split the difference. And I, I think there's a slightly different uh, if I remember correctly, it's been a long time. They have slightly different meanings or are used in slightly different ways. I could be wrong. Um, but, but no, but uh, there is some Chris Foss stuff we do use that, that I think is incredibly effective. So that's one book, um, Never Split the Difference. It's one mm -hmm. of my kind of go-to. I love um, Robert Cialdini. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. read Persuasion um, and, and um, uh, Presuasion. <laughs> Yeah. Um, any other, I know you're not a Grant Cardone fan. We don't have to talk about that. But any but, other books you would recommend? Sure. On this um, on this topic, if you want to talk about negotiation, really, kind of the, the godfather of negotiation was a guy by the name of Roger Dawson. Um, hmm. Old books, all the all the same stuff applies. Um, he gets into mindset. He gets into a lot of stuff. So Roger Dawson, I can't remember the name of his books, but he's got he's got one or two really good ones on negotiation. Uh, so I'd, I'd recommend you go there. Probably the greatest sales book ever written, in my opinion, is uh, Spin Selling. Um, which really gets into the dynamics of a proper sales call based on real world data, what questions are being asked and why. Um, we get really deep in that in our sales training, you know, why are these questions so effective? I think it's not only important to know what questions to ask, but I think it is more important to know why you're asking them. Um, because if you don't know the importance and what you're looking for, that's why salespeople don't ask questions or, or don't stick to the process because they don't understand the gravity of that piece of the sales process. And it's normal, right? If you think something is like, this is just in there, they say I'm supposed to say it, but I have no idea why, you're not gonna say it. You know, why even waste your time? So um, they get into a lot of the mechanics of uh, what a proper sales call looks like. Uh, what are the best practices? When you look at the best salespeople in all industries, what are their commonalities? Uh, and from that, they, they have a, a kind of a sales process. So probably the greatest book I've ever read on sales is Spin Selling. Spin Selling. I'm definitely going to pick that up. And, and some of the best material on sales in general, and yeah, real estate, we're talking about real estate today, but just sales in general comes from this man right here, Mr. John Martinez. So make sure you're following him on Facebook, following him on Instagram, kind of tell everybody where they can find you, where they can learn more about you, John, and, and RES Sales Academy as well. Yeah, so reisalesacademy.com, we'll get to our website. And from there, you can get anywhere. You get to our uh, Facebook group, you can get to, or just go on Facebook and, and search for that, REI Sales Academy. Um, we got a YouTube channel by the same name. So if you put REI Sales Academy into Google, basically all the places we, we're at will pop up. Awesome stuff, man. I can't thank you enough for coming back on the show. And it's been many years, but I'm glad you're back on. And, and uh, guys, I know you're going to get a lot out of this at the very, very, very least make sure you're following this guy on social media, tons of amazing free content, and then do yourself one bigger favor and attend one of his sales trainings. Cause it's just, it's second to none. Do you, you mentioned a, like a 12 week, something that you just finished. What is yeah. that? And is there another one coming up? Yeah. So, I mean, we do it all it's year round. Uh, so the teams we've trained, a lot of them have been with us three, four, five years now, and we keep their current sales teams like uh, on point and just, you know, really, uh, uh, 
go over the material again and again so they stay sharp. And we train all their new acquisition agents. So the way our training works is we go the full 12 week session, then we just start over again. Because as people see turnover, as they're growing, as um, you know, just to stay sharp, those people are always in our training program. So we do it year round. It's awesome, man. And they can find all that at reisalesacademy.com. Absolutely. Great great stuff. John, thank you so much, man. Really do appreciate you. And guys, we appreciate you for tuning in for another episode of the REI Live podcast. We're going to see you next time. Love y'all.